Uh, Chairman Smith, Ranking Member Bess, members of the subcommittee, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. I think my name has been mentioned several times. Uh, I'm uh, Robert Hijiro. Uh, I was born in Uganda because my parents lived there after being forced out of Rwanda in 1959. So I share the same background with uh, the president because he was also raised in, uh, in Uganda as a refugee. I was part of the force that uh, seized control of Chigari in 1994, which actually led to the falling of the former Hutu regime and brought an <coughs> end to the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, I did work uh, for two decades with the Rwandan military and served in different capacities. I had two tours as a peacekeeper, one with the uh, African Union, the initial launch of uh, the full uh, peacekeeping, and another one with the United Nations African Union hybrid mission, which is still ongoing. On returning home, that was 2010, I only found that I had been decommissioned and out of job. What that means in Rwanda is that no single uh, investor or businessman or is going to work with you because it means you are disfavored from the system. So as my colleague just mentioned, it's a controlled business environment. So I went to Uganda to pursue business opportunities. But not so long, I was summoned back to Rwanda. And I was questioned about my links with the former uh, Army Chief of Staff, General Kayumba Nyamwasa, and former National Intelligence and Security Chief, uh, Colonel Patrick Karijaya. These two officers had, of course, fallen out with uh, President Kagame and had fled to South Africa. Uh, this happened to me, but even to other many officers. The most recent examples are Generals Tom Biawagamba, who actually spent the whole of his struggle since 90 to recently in 2010, uh, I think 12, looking after Kagame, protecting him. He was a sector, deputy sector commander in Southern Sudan as a peacekeeper. When he got home, he was taken straight to prison. Same happened to General Frank Rusagara, military attaché in the United Kingdom, after his services, straight to prison. David Kawie served for a long time, straight to prison, and many, many, many others. The military we are talking about today is no longer there. He has young uh, boys doing the peacekeeping, but all the top cadres that actually helped him get into power, they are either in cells, dead, running, you know, all over the world. <laughs> Others are idle in the country, which is a very dangerous uh, aspect when it comes to uh, national security. Well, after my interrogation, I was suspicious. I knew that something is wrong, and they want to use me for a dirty job, as usual. Having served 20 years, I knew exactly why they summoned me, and I, I was met by the military leadership. It was not long my uh, former trainees warned me that if I don't leave the country, I would be in danger. So I fled to Senegal thinking if I go as far as possible, they will forget all about me. But a few months, two or three, somebody is sent by uh, the Director of Military Intelligence, Dan Munuza, to tell me that they have a job for me. He calls me directly and tells me that they have sat down and decided to give me a job. And the job was to go to South Africa 
and eliminate uh, former chief of staff, General Kaimba Nyamwasa, and former national security and intelligence chief, Colonel Patrick Karijaya. And w there's a question you asked, I should state that, on record that, is Kagame involved? Up to where? When Monyuza, director of military intelligence, is giving me a mission, he's on recording the president. Now, I was desperate and I needed time to think about it because I know that whether you do the job or not, you're going to die anyway. So I called uh, Colonel Patrick, gave him the story, and we agreed that I go to South Africa and play by Dan's motions. I went to South Africa. We discussed between me and uh, General Nyamwasa and uh, Colonel Patrick, how to go about it. So we agreed that I should gather as much evidence as possible by recording each and every conversation of instructions of this assassination plan, which could be used like we're using it today. So I recorded these conversations for over seven months. And eventually I told Munoz, of course, that I could do the job. And he said he would offer up to one million USA dollars for the job. We went on and on modalities, the weapons to be used, what he wants me to do, how to do it, etc., etc. And then eventually couldn't send in the money because we were waiting for the money to come in, which would add on this evidence. But they started, uh, you know. The, the boss was saying, he tells me, the boss is saying we should wait. Why can't you eliminate them first before you are paid? And I knew something is wrong, and then I had to free South Africa. I went to Uganda, crossed to Nairobi, and eventually found myself in Belgium, where I live today as a dissident, like others. In Rwanda, like others, I'm a wanted man. Abroad, I'm on the hit list like him, like anybody else. Well, like he said, or the previous speakers, on the, eve, on the New Year's Eve of 2014, Kagame achieved his wish, and that's when uh, Colonel Patrick Kajia was found strangled in uh, Johannesburg Hotel. I should add here that some of these individuals involved are known. We know them. South Africa is still ca ca conducting the investigations. We are waiting, but we know some of these individuals. General Kayumba Nyamasa has survived, survived, I think, three uh, assassination attempts in South Africa. The, 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 the first one was actually shot, but he didn't die. The others, they would find him in a different location and it has been three or four times. He's still living. We don't know for how long. Uh, for me, when this happened, when, the, when Patrick died, I decided to find a reading newspaper, a Canadian new, uh, newspaper, the Globe and Mail, and shared my story. I gave them access to the tapes. These tapes were independently verified or trans and translated. This paper went as far as interviewing uh, former military officers, and they confirmed, indeed, the voice belongs to Munuza. And not only that, there is technology, as you are telling the, 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 the members of the uh, uh, Department of State, we, we can always verify this voice. If the government says, no, this is not Dan Munuza, then they should give us the official voice of Munuza, and we compare with the one I have. If it's not true, then, well, it's not. Uh, I cannot uh, go again over the list of uh, Rwandans who were assassinated abroad and in the country. You have talked about it. He has talked about it. We have submitted a copy of that. It's a long one. But uh, the reality is tragic. Uh, I would like to end with a message to my fellow Rwandans, Hutus and Tutsis, 
have much to attain for with regard to one another. Like me, many Tutsis support the establishment of truly independent court that would you know, follow these crimes committed by President Paul Kagame and his allies. Uh, if you allow me, I'll read this quote from Mandela, which he gave out in 1994. I quote, out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long, must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud. The time for the healing of the wounds has come. The moment to bridge the chasms that divide us has come. The time to build is upon us. I sincerely thank the subcommittee for its time and interest and respectfully ask for help under the help of the entire US Congress to urge Rwandans to put aside their divisions, regional, political, and ethnic, and work peacefully together to end this repressive regime. Thank you.